Hello good people, it's Neo once again from the Overclocker magazine and of course we're looking at AMD's recently released Ryzen 7 9700X CPU, one of two CPUs AMD released yesterday which should be followed by more CPUs next week. Anyway, you've most likely gone through all the technical and architectural changes of the Ryzen 9000 series by now. If not, you can re-watch AMD's presentation on Zen 5 here on YouTube and there are plenty of quality publications that have detailed analysis on the inner workings of the CPUs and improvements made. While we don't have a new chipset or motherboards right now, it does seem as if AMD's 800 series chipset will be with us sometime in September. I'm more excited about how board vendors will kit out their boards as opposed to what the chipsets bring to end users by themselves. As it stands, the X870E is identical to the X670E save for USB V4 being mandatory. Seeing as we already have X670E boards with USB V4 and Thunderbolt, these could technically be called X870E boards, meaning we essentially have three chipsets as opposed to four. The X8870E, the Vanilla 870 and the B650. B850 could be interesting if outfitted with a PCIe Gen 5 X16 slot and USB V4. While this wouldn't turn them into X870 boards, they would make fantastic fully featured budget alternatives. The Ryzen 7 9700X we have here is of course an 8-core processor built at least in part on TSMC's 4 nanometer node. By product positioning, it competes with the Core i7-14700K, which carries a core count advantage over the 9700X. But before we get to the figures, testing was done on the Aorus B650 Elite AX Ice with 64GB of DDR5-6400 memory, all powered by 1600W XPG Fusion PSU and GeForce RTX 4080 GPU. First up is IDA64 memory bandwidth. Nothing surprising here. The standard DDR5-5600 memory bandwidth figures are typical and overclocking delivers anywhere between 7 and 12 gigabytes more of bandwidth. Memory latency is high at 70 nanoseconds, but again, overclocking can reduce that to just 58 nanoseconds and with even tighter timings likely to the low or mid 50s. Power is an area where AMD has made improvements. However, I do not have a Ryzen 7700X to illustrate this, which just leaves the 7800X3D to compare to. That said, the CPU is running a much lower frequency and for the 9700X to just consume 10 watts more is rather impressive. Against the 14700K, the 9700X just walks away with it, with just over half the power requirements of the Intel CPU. Power draw, however, doesn't necessarily translate into operating temperatures, where we see that in normal gaming conditions, there's actually no difference between the 9700X and the 14700K, both operating at around 55 degrees. Peak temperatures under heavy thread loads, however, are 23 degrees lower on the 9700X versus the 14700K. We then get to our rendering tests with V-Ray 5 and Cinebench R23. Here we can see the 14700K walk all over the 9700X, in part due to just more compute cores. When overclocked, however, the 9700X gains a substantial amount of performance, anywhere between 20 and 24%. In Cinebench 2024, the 9700X loses out purely because of its thread count deficit, but I'd say the more interesting figures here are the single core results that show the 9700X is faster than the 14700K. In actuality, a tuned 9700X via PBO, of course, can eclipse the mighty 14900K at 6 GHz in this very test. Impressive and speaking directly to the IPC improvements of Zen 5. Handbrake encoding has never been a strong point for the Ryzen CPUs, but the 9700X is already delivering performance that's dangerously close to what the 7900X can offer. And when PBO is used, this actually eclipses the 7900X despite its core count disadvantage. As far as I know, CPU-Z doesn't have a one-to-one -one correlation between itself and any other program I use quite frankly, but it does serve to show the differences in CPU architecture very quickly. Again, the gains in IPC for Zen 5 are substantial. The 7900X has a peak frequency of 5.6 GHz against the 5.5 GHz of the 9700X, yet the latter still comes out on top. 
add overclocking to it, which takes the frequency to around 5.66 gigahertz or so, and it's nearly 100 points clear of what the 7900X can deliver. Impressive once again. Geekbench 6 is another one where I'm more interested in the single core result. AMD takes a dominant lead over the 14700K and of course the Ryzen 9 7900X. If you add PBO to the mix, it's clear that the 9700X has a generational advantage over everything else. Impressive as well that an overclocked or PBO boosted 9700X manages to beat the 7900X as well, even in the multi-core result. In the 7-zip benchmark, the 9700X puts up a respectable figure, but it's just not in the same ballpark as the other CPUs. Even when overclocked, the thread count disadvantage just can't be helped here. In Super Pi, it's Intel all day. Interesting to see though that the 9700X, despite its IPC advantage, couldn't beat the 7900X. I am rather curious about that result or maybe something in my testing. In White Cruncher 2.5B, the 9700X boosted by PBO claims the top spot, beating everything but the mighty 4900K. At standard settings, it still manages to outperform the 4700K. And then we have 3 Marks CPU profiling test. The one thread result once again shows a sizable gain in IPC as the 9700X beats both the 14700K and the 7900X as well. Better yet, when using PBO, it eclipses the 14900K as well. We then finally get to the gaming benchmarks. In Hitman, the 9700X can't quite keep up with the 14700K and needs an overclock to put up some competitive numbers. When PBO is used, it manages to eclipse the 14700K, especially relevant are the 1% lows. In Forza Horizon 5, out the gate, the 9700X is faster than the 14700K and when overclocked, manages to surpass the Core i9 CPU as well. We then move on to Cyberpunk 2077. The 9700X doesn't quite match the 14700K falling behind in the lowest 1% by some margin. But when using PBO, as has been the case, it actually beats the 14700K adding 30 FPS to the low end. Not bad at all I'd say. We then get to Red Dead Redemption 2 where the AMD CPU is just outright faster than the 14900K let alone the 14700K in the 1% lows. The margins are small and I suspect GPU limitations here, but if you are using an RTX 4080, this is what you should be expecting. Finally, we get to Dying Light 2. PBO here can't save the Ryzen 9700X from being beaten by the Intel Core i7. This one is Advantage Intel. So there you have it, the Ryzen 7 9700X, a reasonable showing for Zen 5, although I suspect from the major review outlets that perhaps more was expected. I fully understand where that sentiment comes from, but also recognize that the 9700X is still a worthwhile CPU. I mean, we await the X3D CPUs, which I think will determine the overall sentiment on the 9000 series going forward. But until then, this is all we have to go on. Overall, the default performance is good in my books, especially for the price and platform. The Ryzen 7 9700X should be around 8,000 Rand or 350 US dollars they say, which is slightly lower than the price of the Core i7 14700K and the Ryzen 7 7800X3D at present. And as is, if I were looking at AM5, I'd actually shortlist the 9700X, but I would want to see how the X3D chips perform before making a purchasing decision. I'd most certainly not buy a 7700X unless it was spectacularly cheap as the 9700X is a better and more capable CPU by all measure. As for overclocking or PBO, well, Scatterbench actually has a video up showing how you can get up to maybe 5.8 GHz on the Ryzen 9700X, and I for one was able to get into Windows at DDR5-8400, but more on that in the appropriate DRAM review however. Until then, let me know what you guys think of AMD's Ryzen 7 9700X. Have you pre-ordered? Are you picking up today? Are you impressed or not as much? Let me know in the comments below. If you haven't already, please share, like and subscribe or not if you don't feel like it. Either way, take good care of yourselves and until the next time, peace.